wills of your people, O God, move us into new ways of living. Stir up the minds of your people, O God. Move us into deeper ways of thinking. Stir up the hearts of your people, O God. Move us into fuller ways of loving. Stir us thoroughly. That's our call for today. As a Christian community, we talk about how we come together to, to learn, to listen, to respond. And it is about the grace and the gifts that we are given and how we are to use those particular gifts. For two or three are gathered in my name, Love will be found. Life will abound. By name we are called, from water we are sent to become the eyes and hands of Christ. A wonderful end. One we become no longer strangers, no longer empty or frail, filled with the Spirit, every hunger satisfied. Christ is the center. first time that I've ever preached on the Corinthians text that we read today. I don't recall ever hearing anyone preach on about eating meat that's offered to idols. Interesting passage. Because one of the reasons is it doesn't have any 21st century counterpart or doesn't mean anything for us. Well, let's find out. In the New Testament in particular, there are uh, three or four mentions of not meeting, eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. There's in this passage, and there's two in Revelation, two of the churches are castigated for eating meat that has been uh, offered to idols. And it's also reported in Acts as part of the first Jerusalem Council, uh, that that was the only thing that the Gentiles, or one of the only thing that the Gentiles, they didn't have to go through circumcision or follow any of the Jewish laws, but this was one that was mentioned explicitly. And so that is something that was certainly uh, relevant to the time, but is it wrong? I mean, we've been spending a fair amount of time uh, over the last little while with Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And from those readings and from our own knowledge of the letter, which we hear often, or parts of it, at weddings and funerals, what can we say, or what can we assume, well, let's be careful not to assume, but what can we talk about in terms of what we want to know about the church in Corinth. Well, for one thing, we know that Corinth is, is a cultural and trade center of the empire. It's a very, very important city. And the church has taken root. And the church is growing. We have a sense that unlike other places, it is a more diverse church, especially on the social, economic, and educational side. And the two of those are certainly linked. But the question within the church is how does one live faithfully in this particular culture and in this context? And as the anthem said, how does one abound does life indeed abound in the community and in the people that they serve? But that's also part of the problem, is that in the Corinth church, there is an abundance of gifts. And like in any 
zealous. I was going to say zealous, zealous, but there's in, their, in the person's willingness, to, they become almost almost uh, consumed with the thought of how can I best use this particular gift that I've been given. And sometimes becomes much more important in their own eyes than another. And what do we do with the little ones? Those of little faith. That's the problem I have with this text, is that Paul does come across as being rather arrogant. He calls them little ones, or little faith. As I was looking at it, I, I started to think, well, perhaps it's more like what Jesus did with Peter. I believe that one of Peter's nicknames had for him was little faith. So it's used in a used in a, a, a tongue-in-cheek way. In today's reading, Paul addresses the cultural norm that gives privilege and status to those who are educated and financially secure enough to buy meat. The norm of privileging the elite is a norm of the Roman Empire which assumes that the hierarchy real relationship based on rank within the imperial system. Paul recognizes this imperial norm of privileging the knowledge of the elite runs counter to the collective witness of the church, which is governed by an altogether different type of knowledge. The well-off members who can afford to purchase meat from idols are apparently bringing meat dishes to the this creates tension and a conflict for those who not only are unable to afford this meat, but also believe that eating such meat undermines the gospel witness. It's analogous to serving liquor in front of an alcohol. Would be one way of looking at it. It appears that the social life of the upper classes in Corinth revolved around frequent feasts. If you go back into ancient uh, histories, you will find invitations that are sent out for different occasions. There are people come to a feast and to enjoy, enjoy this meal in some of the temples. There are banquets and celebrations and public events that are held in these, in these temples, in these public dining spaces. It's part of the well-to-do, the, the, those who patronized the meat markets collected, connected with the temples for the meat, used to do, used in their households. If one had scruples against eating meats offered to idols, it would be virtually excluded from the participation in the social life of the Christian community. Also present in the Corinthian church were ordinary folks. People whose income and habits allowed for very little meat in their diets. And for these people, who are sometimes labeled in the context of the gospel, and even in our own context, superstitious or narrow-minded, eating meat offered to idols or uh, not sure whether the meat you're eating is offered to idols or not also presents a problem. Do we have any uh, any uh, label readers, militant label readers? I'm becoming a label reader with, uh, because as you get older, there are dietary needs that you have. But I also have some family members, especially the ones that are in Florida, and they'll see this this week, and uh, that are militant about it. Uh, they spend uh, 
Bruce Rigdon writes, At the heart of Paul's message is a peculiar understanding of Christian freedom. Freedom is not the right to choose to do as one wishes. It is not simply a lack of restrictions or a negation of the law or of other requirements. Christian freedom is grounded in love. God's love for us in Jesus Christ. If love is a matter of knowledge, it is God's knowledge, knowing of us. Martin Luther wrote, A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Freedom is slavery to Christ, so that the Christian life can become responsible for one another. That is central to what it means to be in Christ. Paul comes down very hard on those who justify their behaviors on the basis of theological arguments, even arguments with which he agrees. He himself, if necessary, will become a vegetarian for the rest of his life rather than to harm those who might be harmed by the eating of idle meat or the possibility of eating idle meat. I mean, it is never easy to escape the dominant cultural norms in which Christians, in which we find ourselves. Historically, it was the embracing of cultural norms that led Christians to rationalize and justify slavery, the subordination of women, exclusion based on sexual orientation, and exploitation of her. These social norms are frequently difficult to recognize because they're simply a part of what everyone knows and accepts, especially those in positions of power and authority. For Paul, living in community requires a certain type of knowledge, a transformative love revealed by God in Christ. It is a knowledge that challenges all the systems of knowledge and therefore is vital to the mission of the church. K. Myron Toso shares a story that I think helps us get our heads around this passage. She's attending a family funeral and she is taking care of her granddaughter at the service. She writes, the cavernous church narthex was crowded and noisy. As mourners gathered for the visitation prior to the funeral, as it was clear this was overwhelming for our 18-month-old granddaughter, I carried her into the quiet sanctuary. She immediately stilled, looked around in awe, and then pointed while quietly asking, What that? Lit candles, a 360-degree band of stained glass, illuminated by bright sunshine, music from the pipe organ, Art on the sanctuary walls, water in the baptismal font. Each of these captured and held her attention. When I started to walk out of the sanctuary, she emphatically shook her head, No! And so we remained. Did this toddler possess knowledge of what was transpiring? Probably not. Was she blessed by the love poured out by the Spirit? Absolutely. Might her presence, her face reflecting a sense of wonder and awe, provide another glimpse of the holy for the arriving mourners? Probably. To the Quorum Church, Paul addresses 
today's churches, our church, would be well served to heed Paul's words. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Particularly in relation to practices that promote full inclusion. Churches need to be willing to explore constantly additional ways to strengthen ministries based 